أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله we reached ayah number 150 and uh, in today's session we're going to do our best inshallah to cover the uh, the remaining verses so we can inshallah commence with another surah of the Quran in our next session so in this session I'm not going to go, I'm not going to be able to go in depth. I'm just going to touch upon some of the main points in each of the verses. And if I find that there are any parts of a verse that we've already covered, I'll kind of just, you know, breeze through it. In verse number 150, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ هَلُمَّ شُهَدَاءَكُمُ الَّذِينَ يَشْهَدُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ هَذَا فَإِنْ شَهِدُوا فَلَا تَشْهَدْ مَعَهُمْ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا وَالَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ وَهُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ Allah says, so bring forward your witnesses to prove that God did forbid so and so. If they bring such witnesses, be not among them and follow not the desires of such that treat our signs as falsehood and as such, believe not in the hereafter, for they hold others equal with their guardian Lord. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about those arbitrary restrictions and those rituals that were introduced by the pagans. Now in the previous verses, we mentioned that they claimed that, you know, this was the law of God, that these practices... You know, the, the sacrifice of children for their idols, the, the various dietary restrictions. The Meccans were claiming that this has a religious basis. And in the previous verses, Allah rhetorically asks them, were you present when, Allah, when God legislated these, these uh, injunctions, these rulings? Now here again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you, don't, if you can't bear, if you don't have any evidence that God himself legislated these laws if you have no direct evidence then do you at least have someone to bear witness do you have a shaheed a witness can you cite a previous prophet who introduced these practices that have become common in your culture allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet that they're not able to you don't lend them credence by bearing witness that these these rituals have any religious basis. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the baselessness of a lot of these rituals and customs that were introduced by the Arabs. Now, in verse number 151, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them a list of religious prohibitions now pro now previously in the verses leading up to this there were many verses where allah spoke to us about what the meccans deemed haram it's haram for example for women to consume you know the meat of the 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 infant that is in the uh, the womb of its mother so they had all of these ridiculous religious prohibitions that were baseless they had no evidence for it they had no one to lend credence to it as a witness. In ayah number 151, Allah says everything, all of the muharramat that was common among the Arabs, that was all nonsense. In verse 151, Allah says, قُلْ Say, O Muhammad, تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ Say, O Muhammad, come. I will rehearse to you, I will inform you what God has forbidden. So what you guys forbade upon yourselves has no connection to divine law. 
but the, what I will what I will list for you are some of the muharramat that have always existed in every Sharia from the time of Adam to the time of the Holy Prophet. So you know, in the Jewish tradition, how they have the Ten Commandments. In the next three verses, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is going to mention essentially what we can call the Ten Commandments in the Islamic tradition. And these are commandments that are not specific to any Sharia, meaning that these Ten Commandments can be found in the teachings of the Holy Prophet. They can be found in the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam, in the teachings of Musa, Ibrahim. So these Ten Commandments are essentially the common denominator in the teachings of all prophets. قُلْ تَعَالَوْا أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ Say, come, I will rehearse what God has really prohibited you from. That you join not anything as equal to Him. أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And be good to your parents. Meaning, don't mistreat your parents. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ And do not kill your children because of poverty. We will provide sustenance for you and for them. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنٍ And do not commit acts and do not approach acts of indecency, whether open or secret. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ Do not take any life which Allah has made sacred except by way of justice and law. ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So there are five commandments here. أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا Don't associate partners with God. Don't commit shirk. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Goodness to parents. Don't kill children out of because fear of poverty, out of poverty. Number four, don't approach fawahish. And number five, do not kill, do not take any life without a justifiable reason. Now, so these are five that are mentioned in verse 151. Now it's interesting that when you look at the order of these commandments, you know, it's it's almost like a mirror image of Risalat al huquq by Imam Zain al-Abideen. Where Imam Zain al-Abideen, what does he do? He begins with what? Haqqullah, the right of God. The first right, the first commandment relates to Tawheed. And Tawheed is the cornerstone of every divine message that has been sent to humanity. Everything revolves around Tawheed. So you, you, you see that the commandments begin with Tawheed. Don't associate partners with God. Because if you make anything else other than Him the object of your love and your pursuits, you will inevitably suffer. You will suffer internally. You won't feel satiated. You won't feel fulfilled. So Haqqullah, it begins with Haqqullah. And then immediately it transitions to the rights of people among people the ones who have the most right over you are your parents so haqqullah and then haqqun nas the rights of people and among people the ones who have the most right over you are your parents throughout the holy quran allah always links seems to always link his worship with goodness to parents. It's almost as though your parents are an indicator of divine wrath or divine pleasure. If you want to know if Allah is pleased with you, in many cases, see how your parents feel about you. Because your parents are God's signal of whether he's pleased with you or you have incurred his wrath. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا and being good to your parents is not contingent upon the fact that they're pious. Even if they're non-Muslim, you still have to be good to them. You still have to treat them with respect 
with dignity. Don't kill your children because of poverty. You know, and this happens, this happened during, you know, in 7th century Arabia, and it happens until today, where the most innocent are not even given a chance to live. Why? Because people don't trust God. That's really what it comes down to. That's why Allah says, I will provide for you. You're poor. You're already worried about how you're, where your next meal is going to come, how you're going to pay your bills. Allah says, I provide for you and for them. You know, you know here, you know, there's another verse in the Quran where Allah, when he speaks about killing children because of poverty, one verse, I can't remember what the verse is, but it, it says, don't kill your children out of fear of poverty, meaning that they're not poor, but they have a fear that it might create financial problems. And then Allah says what? We will provide for them and for you. But here, because they're already in poverty, Allah mentions that I will provide for you and for your children because they're already worried about themselves. So don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. The same Lord who sustains every single creature on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide. You're not the provider. Allah provides for them through you. And He provides you through other means. You know, the word fawahish is the plural of the word fahisha. Now, most of the time in the Arabic language, fahisha refers to sexual indecency. Notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't approach indecency. He doesn't say don't commit it. And you'll find in the next verse when Allah speaks about the wealth of orphans, He also says do not approach it. He doesn't say don't steal their money. Allah, Allah says do not approach the wealth of the orphans. Now the word approach is used when it comes to sexual indecency and and when it's used with in relation to wealth because human beings have a natural inclination they're very weak when it comes to money and controlling their sexual desires this is why you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks about sexual indecency and he speaks about being fair and treating the wealth of others in a just manner he uses the word wala taqrabu do not approach it because if you approach it you most likely you will commit that sin wala taqrabu al-fawahish ma dhahara minha wa ma batan when it comes to zina there are very strict regulations that govern the interactions with the opposite gender why because there's a natural attraction to the opposite gender you know if you if you take one step, you know, as they say, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Allah wants to eliminate the first step. That's why zina begins with the eyes. Allah says, don't approach it. Don't approach fawahish. And then verse number 151 ends by saying, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ And Take not life which God has made sacred except by way of justice and law. Now you see in this ayah, two out of the five commandments relate to the preservation of life, which shows you that in the Islamic tradition and in the teachings of all prophets, it was always emphasized that life is sacred. Life is sacred. In verse 152, Allah says, Do not approach the, the property of, orf, of the orphan. So 
So do not come near the property of the orphan except to improve it until he attains the age. When they reach the age of maturity and sound judgment, you hand over their property. But until then, you're not allowed to touch it unless you're trying to make it grow, unless you're trying to protect it, or if the if the guardian is in financial need, they're permitted. The wali is permitted to take a portion of it, but they have to pay it back. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلَ وَالْمِيزَانَ بِالْقِسْطِ And weigh with full, and full, give measure and weight with full justice. Here Allah is speaking about business ethics. Being ethical when it comes to your business transactions. And then Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. No burden do we place on any soul but that which it can bear. Now what's the connection with being ethical in business dealings and that clause, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah doesn't put a burden on any soul that, that it cannot bear. When you're engaged in a business transaction, I'll give you a very simple example. If someone pays you money for five pounds of rice, you have to give them exactly five pounds of rice. But let's be real, brothers and sisters. Are you able to give someone exactly 5.00000 pounds of rice? It may be a little bit more, a little bit less. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, do your best. It might not be possible to be exactly and perfectly just because we're fallible human beings. When you go to the, the butcher shop, the butcher, you may have ordered 10 pounds of meat, but he, maybe he gave you 9.99999. Does that mean Allah is going to punish him? No, he did his best. So Allah says, we're not going to place a burden on you that you cannot bear. But do your best to be just and fair. وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ and when you speak, speak justly, even if a near relative is concerned. You know, brothers and sisters, it's easy to speak justly when you're dealing with other people, right? But what would you do if one of your own family members was doing something inappropriate, was committing an act of dhulm. A lot of times we turn a blind eye because, you know, as the saying goes, it's easier to go along to get along. You know, sometimes people turn a blind eye to the behavior of some of their family members. They don't want to speak out against them because it'll create tension in the family. Allah says, speak the truth, even if it relates to a relative. And this is exactly what happened in Islamic history, brothers and sisters. Uthman ibn Affan, when he came to power, why do you think there were so many problems in his administration? Because he had family members who were looting the Islamic treasury, but he was too embarrassed to say anything. He didn't want to call out any of his relatives or members of his family. And then you, you juxtapose that attitude with Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam, he's the Khalifa. His brother comes to get a little bit more from Baytul Mal. The Imam refuses him. He says that you, are you trying to burn? Are you trying to burn me in the flames of Jahannam? So you have to be strict. You have to have a sense of justice and fairness, even when you're dealing with family members. You're not allowed to bend the rules to accommodate family. وَبِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْفُوا And fulfill the covenant of Allah. If you make a nadr, if you make any promise, if you say, Wallah, you're going to do something, fulfill that covenant. Don't take it lightly when you bring Allah's name into things. When you make a promise, when you make a covenant, fulfill it. ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ and then Allah says in verse 153, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا 
ولا تتبع السبل سبلا فتفرق بكم عن سبيله verily this is my way leading straight so follow it follow not other paths that will scatter you from his great path so again the final commandment is to adhere to the the way of god and not to become disunited there's a call for unity here now when you look at these 10 commandments you find that most of them relate to what interpersonal relations relations many of these commandments the, the majority of them relate to what the rights of people you know if you look at your risala whatever marja you follow you open it up you look at the book it's divided up into two main sections right you have ibadat and then you have muamalat is the section of ibadat longer or is the section of muamalat more lengthy you find muamalat transactions many of the laws of islam actually deal with your social your economic transactions with people so being a religious person doesn't mean that you just fulfill your religious rituals allah says my way sirat al mustaqim is to be very cautious in the way that you deal with my servants in islamic spirituality one of the most important principles is al ishfaq ala al khaliqa to be compassionate with people to be fair to have a love for humanity that you treat everyone as though this is the family of god of course not in a literal sense but in a spiritual sense you're very delicate you're very cautious you're very careful when it comes to your interactions with others and then in verse 154 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ثُمَّ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابَ تَمَامًا عَلَى الَّذِي أَحْسَنْ وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لَعَلَّهُمْ بِلِقَاءِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ Moreover, we gave Moses the book, completing our favor to those who do right, and explaining all things in detail and a guide and a mercy that they might believe in the meeting with their Lord. Now, as I mentioned, those 10 commandments that we spoke about, these 10 commandments, you can trace them back to what Adam was teaching, to what Nuh السلام, was teaching, to what Shu'aib was teaching. These 10 commandments are consistent throughout the history of prophets. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then we gave Musa the book. You find that up until the time of Musa alayhi salam, the message that was propagated by prophets was pretty simple, meaning that it wasn't very comprehensive. The religion of God, it had its rituals, of course, but it was very simplistic in the sense that it really revolved around those Ten Commandments and you had you know, certain rituals here and there. But the first time in the history of prophets whereby you have a comprehensive, detailed sharia is with the revelation of Torah to Musa. That's why Allah says, Thumma atayna Musa al -kitab. Then we gave Musa the book. We completed what was revealed before Musa. Now Allah begins to give details. There is a more sophisticated system of laws that govern human behavior. The Torah was a very comprehensive system of guidance. In, this, in the same way that, Quran, that Islam, Quran was very comprehensive and detailed, the Sharia of Musa was like that. It was a source of mercy for people. If you were to practice the Torah, you would be able to access divine mercy. 
It was a source of guidance and mercy. And subhanAllah, the Quran is also described as a book of khudan, a book of guidance and mercy, and a book that is comprehensive. So perhaps they will believe in the meeting with their Lord. Now, oftentimes when we speak about meeting God, we always fast forward to the day of judgment. But in Islamic spirituality, Liqa'ullah is something that we want to experience here and now. So you see that the teachings of Musa were also a system of, of beliefs. They were also teachings and guidelines that would allow people to experience the joy of meeting God even in this life. And then in verse 155, Allah then speaks about the next comprehensive religious system that was given to humanity in the form of the Quran. Wahada, Allah says in verse 155, Wahada and this is a book, meaning the Quran, which we have revealed as a blessing. So follow it and be righteous, so you may receive mercy. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Quran with one important adjective. So the Torah was described as as being detail, being tafsilan, it was described as being a source of guidance and mercy. Now these are adjectives and descriptions of the Qur'an in other verses. In verse 155, Allah calls the Qur'an Mubarak. Now the word Mubarak, we translate it as blessing and we move on. But in the Arabic language, the word baraka, because mubarak comes from, comes from the word baraka, the word baraka conveys two important ideas. Baraka means an nama, which means to grow, right? And the idea here is that Islam, this Quran, if you study it, if you adhere to it, it will facilitate your growth as a human being. It nurtures human growth. It nurtures spiritual growth. So one of the meanings of baraka is that it means to grow. Another meaning of baraka is what? Al-baqa. It means something that endures. That's why the Arabs when they would see a pool of water that was sitting for a long time, they would call it birka. Birka is basically standing water. It's been there for a long time. And because it's been there and it's endured and it hasn't been dried up and evaporated, they call it birka. So mubarak conveys the idea of growth. It's something that grows. It facilitates our growth. And it's something that's enduring. Meaning the Qur'an will always be relevant. You know, there are some books, as time passes, they become obsolete. They become irrelevant. But this book is Mubarak. It, endure, it will endure the test of time. It will always, it will always give. It's always going to be relevant. And be righteous. You know, the Qur'an is only going to have this effect. The barakah of the Qur'an will only benefit you if you have taqwa, if you follow its commandments and you avoid its prohibitions. When you do that, you may receive mercy. In verse 156, Allah says, And ta'ulu inna ma unzila al wa in now here Allah is speaking to the Meccans uh, because we're, this is, Surah Al-An'am is a Meccan Surah. So Allah then says to them that we revealed this Quran which is in Arabic and the primary audience are who? The Arabs. Allah says, lest you say, so you don't say, O Arabs, O Meccans, 
the book was sent down, you know, this revelation, here the book refers to this, the generic revelation of God. The book was sent down to two groups of people before us, meaning the Jews and the Christians. They were recipients of revelation. They're Ahl al-Kitab. وَإِن كُنَّا عَنْ دِرَاسَتِهِمْ لَغَافِلِينَ Look at this silly argument. The Meccans are basically saying that Allah says, I revealed the Qur'an so you Arabs, you Meccans, don't say that God only revealed to the Jews and the Christians and we had no access to their books. They're making an excuse for why they're misguided why they're lost. The Injil is not in our language. It's in Aramaic. Torah is in Hebrew. We don't, we don't speak, the, we don't have access to Wahi. We don't have access to Revelation. And this is the excuse that they use. Allah says, you, have, you don't have any excuse anymore. Now, I have revealed a message that you can access. You know, brothers and sisters, when I read this verse, it really made me think about, you know, the types of things we're going to say on the Day of Judgment. Will any of us living in the year 2018 be able to make the argument that, Ya Allah, I wasn't religious, I wasn't obedient to you because I just, I never, I never knew. We can't use the argument of not having access to God's message. Allah will say, you had, you had an iPhone, you had an iPhone, you had internet. You had scholars who delivered lectures in many different languages. You have no excuse anymore. The message has now become available and accessible to you. So here Allah is saying to the Arabs that, okay, I'll let you slide when it comes to the Injil, when it comes to the Torah. You say that it wasn't in our language. Now a book has come to you in your language. And then, in verse 157, Allah says, <laughs> Then the arrogance comes out. <clears throat> the Arabs were arrogant not only today, they were arrogant in 7th century Arabia. What do they say? Allah says, Or lest you should say, if the book had only been sent down to us, we should have followed its guidance better than them. <laughs> Look at the competition. They say, if you were to reveal to us, we would be better than the Jews and the Christians. But we didn't receive anything. Allah says, Allah says, now, bayina has come to you. Allah doesn't say a book has come to you, O Meccans. Or Arabs. He uses the word bayina. Bayina means something that is so clear that it's undeniable. Even those who oppose the Prophet in private, they admitted that the Quran was beyond the ability of, of human beings. They knew that this is this is beyond the eloquence of human beings. We have revealed to you bayina min rabbikum wa hudan wa rahmatun again. A source of guidance and mercy, just like the Torah. فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ كَذَّبَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَصَدَفَ عَنْهَا سَنَجْزِ الَّذِينَ يَصْدِفُونَ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَصْدِفُونَ Now here the verse ends with who is more unjust than the one who rejects the signs of God and turns away from it. The word صَدَفَ means to turn away from something without even giving it any consideration. You, you turn away from something in a way that you're, it's as though you're saying that it's so insignificant, it's so worthless that it's not worth my attention. And by doing this, they were discouraging others from even listening to the Holy Prophet. That's why whenever Allah says, who is more unjust, he's usually referring to people who are behaving in such a way that it's turning other people away. From God's message. Now it's bad enough that you don't want to listen, that you don't want to lend your ears to the words of the Prophet, but it's a totally another caliber of injustice when you become an impediment to others 
in their pursuit of the truth. In verse 158, Allah says, أو يأتي ربك أو يأتي بعض آيات ربك. Are they waiting? Allah here is posing a rhetorical question. So you have these Meccans, they've seen all of these ayat, all of these proofs have been sent to them. They have the best messenger in the form of the Holy Prophet. You have Ali ibn Abi Talib there. You have all of this nur. You have the nur of revelation of the, and you have the nur of ma'sumin. Allah says, are they waiting to see if the angels come to them? Are they waiting for Malik al maut for Malik, Malik, the angel of death to come? To remove the veils for them or are they waiting for God himself to reveal himself to them or are they waiting for some of the signs of God meaning some of the signs of the coming of the day of judgment according to some commentators when, when that happens when they when the, when you transition to the Akhira in Barzakh on the day of judgment Allah says, no good will come to you unless you believed before this. Meaning, having faith and saying, now I believe, after death, or when you witness the signs of the, of the Day of Judgment, this type of Iman doesn't have value. Because you don't have a choice anymore. The, the, the veils have been lifted. The exam is over. It's not enough just to have faith. You have to earn righteous deeds through your faith. The Prophet has said, it says to them, wait, and I am too waiting with you. We will see. It's a form of a threat. That if you don't believe, let's both wait and see what happens. You're calling me a liar today. You say that, I am preaching tales of the ancients. We'll wait. We'll wait and see how the 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 end the, the story of man ends. Inna ladina farraku dina um wakanu shia an lesta minhum fi shay. Inna ma amruhum ila Allah thumma yunabihum bima kanu yaf alun. As for those who divide their religion and break up into sects. You have no part in them in the least. Their affair is with Allah. He will in the end tell them the truth of all that they did. Brothers and sisters, every prophet was a unifier. Divisions arose usually after the departure of the prophets. Now, what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina farraku dino? What does it mean to divide your religion? There's a lot of discussion among the ulama. Some scholars say dividing your religion refers to the fact, refers to what a lot of people do when it comes to religion. They divide religion into what I will accept as truth and what is just not acceptable to me. So, for example, there are many who say, I will accept everything about Islam, but this these ayat about men being permitted to have more than one wife, you know, I'll put that to the side. This is an example of dividing your religion. You take what is agreeable to you, what is compatible with, with your sensibilities, and then you put the rest aside. Allah says, أَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in part of the book and you reject other parts? It's not up to you. A prerequisite is not that it make you know all the laws of Islam make you feel good. There's hikmah behind Allah's rulings. So don't divide your religion into what I will practice because it makes sense to me, and what I will ignore and turn away from because it's just it's not something that I'm that makes that sits well with me. Other scholars say that. When Allah says, don't divide yourselves into sects, some scholars say that this is a verse that is speaking about what the Jews and the Christians did. You know, Isa alayhi salam, 
He was preaching Tawheed. He was preaching Tawheed. People adulterated his message, and then you have the proliferation of different sects, all claiming to be representative of the true message of Jesus Christ. Same thing with, with Musa a.s. But here, scholars also say that it's as though Allah is foreshadowing that what happened to the community of Musa and Isa, it will also happen to the Muslim community. There will emerge certain individuals because of political motivations, because of worldly desires, they will also divide the religion. Imam al-Baqir in a hadith, he says, he speaks about this idea of, of dividing religion. He says, they divided, they, they made Islam into sects when they removed Ali ibn Abi Talib from his rightful position. If you want to trace back, when did Islam truly become divided? It goes back to that point. When people ignored what the Holy Prophet declared on the day of Ghadir. So when Allah says, do not divide your religion, He's speaking about these people. Those who began, who planted the seeds of division, who refused to obey the Holy Prophet. Who, who produced ridiculous reasons why they were more worthy of occupying the member of Rasulullah after his death. And therefore, because of their actions, they sowed the seeds of division. And it's interesting when you look at what Allah says. You know, usually when someone commits a great crime, Allah says, He mentions something about punishment. But what does Allah say? He says, Ya Rasulullah, you're not a part of them. Their affair is with Allah. Allah doesn't even mention what He's going to do to them. You know, some you know, when you're when you're many of you may can maybe you can relate to this. You know, when you were growing up and you do something that angers your parents. And your parent says, I'm going to ground you, or I'm going to take your bike away, I'm going to take your video games away. They mention the punishment. That might scare you, but it's probably more terrifying when they say, I'll deal with you later. Right? When they don't, because you don't know what the punishment is going to be. You're left in suspense. Allah, when He addresses those who created divisions in the community of Musa, in the community of Isa, those who planted the seeds of disunity by sidelining Ahlul Bayt, Salawatullahi Alayhi Majma'een, Allah says, I will deal with them. That their affair is with me. This is how severe the crime is. Allah says, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do to them, but I will deal with them. And then Allah says in Ayah 160, we have to move a bit quicker so we can finish. مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about His generosity. You know, brothers and sisters, life is difficult. I think we can all agree that life is challenging. You know, whenever you, whenever you take an exam, you know, you usually ask your, you know, your instructor, is there going to be opportunities for extra credit? Are you going to grade on a curve? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent 124,000 prophets. He reveals a, a number of scriptures. He gives you aql. And He says that when you do good, this, this ayah shows you that Allah doesn't want to punish you. Allah wants you to enter Jannah. He says if you do good, I will multiply it by 10. In Islam, there is no concept of you do one good deed and you get one hasana. Minimum, the bare minimum for any good deed is 10 hasanat. Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashra amthaliha. If you do good, your reward is multiplied tenfold. And if you commit sin, you know, Allah is not itching to punish you. 
Allah says, if you commit sin, it's recorded as one sin. Allah doesn't multiply the sins. He multiplies the rewards. But he's, he's fair with you. If you commit one sin, this is the punishment. And furthermore, so there's no ghul. It's not that you, it's the, the punishment always justify, the, the punishment always corresponds to the crime. And furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has opened the door of repentance and mercy. So if you sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow the angels to record the sin immediately. A hadith mentioned that you're given a seven hour grace period to seek your repentance. So the angels would not have even recorded the sin. If you commit a sin, the punishment is appropriate for the crime. One sin, one punishment. But if you do a good deed, it's multiplied by 10 at a, at, the, at a bare minimum. There are some verses where Allah speaks about charity and He says they're multiplied 700 fold and even more. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse one, in 161, He says, Qul ila siratin mustaqeem. Deenan, Qiyaman, Millet Ibrahim, Hanifan, Wakan, Amin al Wamakan, Amin al Mushrikin. The Holy Prophet is instructed to say that verily my Lord has guided me to a way that is straight. The Holy Prophet was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His way, his sunnah is the best of ways. It's the shortest distance between you and God. And what the Prophet is teaching is not something that is entirely new you know the arabs would pride themselves they were very proud the, uh, proud of the fact that they were arabs they were very proud of the fact that they are following the tradition of their forefathers that's why if you notice in the quran whenever they are invited to islam they say what is this islam we are following the footsteps of our forefathers allah says you claim to follow the way of your forefathers you are arabs you are all from the descendants of ibrahim if you claim to be followers of your forefathers ibrahim is your forefather and he was a monotheist what happened to you people you started to worship idols you started to ascribe partners to allah if you're all about preserving our culture and following our ancestors, Ibrahim is your ancestor. Ibrahim is the, the, the champion of Tawheed. He didn't commit shirk. He didn't commit theoretical shirk, and he didn't commit practical shirk. And that's why in verse 162, you know, usually when we speak about Tawheed and shirk, you automatically think that these are ideas that are in your mind. But the Prophet is instructed to say what in verse 162? Practical Tawheed is mentioned. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, O Muhammad, truly my prayer and my rituals, my worship, my life and my death are all for Allah, the cherisher and the sustainer of the worlds. Everything that you do should be for him to seek his pleasure. So here, this is an important reminder that Tawheed is actually behavior. Tawheed is action. Tawheed is not just the idea that there's one God. Everything about your life is Tawheed. Verse 163, <laughs> No partner does he have. This I am commanded, and I am the first of those who bow to his will. The Prophet is saying that I am the first among the Muslims. The Rasulullah is the last of God's prophets, but he's saying that I'm the first one to submit. Some scholars say that this is a reference to the, the, uh, the metaphysical realm whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares to all of the souls of people, am I not your Lord? Alastu bi rabbikum? 
the Prophet was the first one to respond saying Bella so in this worldly life he's number 124,000 in the line of Prophets but in Alam al-Dhar when we were all called upon to bear witness to God's Lordship the first soul to respond to that call was the soul of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and therefore he says that I am the first Muslim and that's why the Prophet he says in the famous hadith narrated in Sunni and Shia traditions Kuntu nabiyan wa adamu al -ma'i wa I was a prophet while Adam was between water and clay meaning before Adam's physical creation I existed in the form of a spirit that we believe in Islamic theology that the first thing that God created was the most perfect creation in the form of the nur of the Holy Prophet. And from that nur is the light of Amir al Mu'mineen and the Ahlul Bayt. And from them, Allah created everything in existence. Everything in creation flows through them. This is why Islamic philosophers they say, Ahlul Bayt, they are wasitatul faith. They are the channel. Of divine grace because everything flows through them. Verse 164, Allah says, Qul, Shall I seek other than my Lord who is the cherisher of all things? Say, shall I seek for my cherisher other than Allah when he is the cherisher of all things that exist? Every soul draws the meat of its acts on none, but itself no bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here again referencing the idea that you are accountable for your actions. You will not be held accountable for the actions of others. And then in verse 165, and this is the final verse of the surah, Allah says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَكُمْ خَلَائِفَ الْأَرْضِ It is he who has made you his representatives and his inheritors. You know, brothers and sisters, as a human being, you have to understand your worth. You have to understand who you are. You have to truly value yourself. Allah says, I have appointed you, human beings, as my representatives on earth. Allah says, you represent me. So don't be a bad representative. You have to be godly in your behavior. Because you represent God. God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you represent me on earth. Because your soul is unique in the idea that you have the power to reflect my 99 names. There is no other creation that has the capacity to be a mirror that can reflect God's attributes in the most powerful way. This is why Allah says, I made you my Khalifa on earth. Allah, when He created Adam, He says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. We are the children of Allah's Khalifa, and therefore, consequently, we are God's representatives on earth. Allah says, He raised you in rank, some above others. Allah didn't create us all equal on earth. He gives some, He gives more wealth to others. He gives more wealth, more intelligence to others, more beauty to others. He distributes his blessings. He makes some people more eloquent, some are better writers, some are more creative, others are more resourceful. He, he gives you different blessings to see how you respond. Will you, will you still be, remain generous when I give you wealth? Will you care? Will you have rahmah? Will you be compassionate? So Allah gives you these various blessings to see which one of his names will you reflect in your life. You are 
impoverished. Will you be shakul? Allah is shakul. Will you be shakul? Will you be pay? Allah is patient with His creatures. Will you also be patient? Allah subhanahu wa taala is merciful. Will you be merciful? Allah is beautiful. He's jameel. Will you also be a source of spiritual beauty on earth? So you are the representatives on earth. Liabluakum. He spreads, he, he, he erases you in different degrees to test you. Your Lord is swift in retribution and he is oft forgiving and merciful. And so the, the surah ends with these two attributes. The idea that God is swift in punishing, but he's also forgiving and merciful. And this is also a reminder, and we've mentioned this, that a believer has to be balanced. Don't be the person that says, oh, Allah is merciful, I'll do whatever I want, because he's merciful. Brother, he's Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, let's go to the casino. Because Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, therefore we should go to the casino. You have to be balanced. Yes, Allah is forgiving, but Allah is also swift in his punishment. You have to have that balance. The believer has two wings that allow him to ascend to Allah. The wing of fear and the wing of hope. You need both of them to propel yourself to your Lord. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us. We thank Allah Azza wa Jal for giving us the tawfiq to go through this blessed surah, Surah Al-An'am. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to also give us the tawfiq to continue our study of other surahs of the Holy Quran was sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We have a few minutes for Q&A. If there are any questions or comments, please don't ask me to summarize the entire surah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One more thing that I wanted to mention before we go to Q&A is that I was actually reading this today and it didn't even occur to me that some scholars, and I haven't counted this, so I, I can't say this with full, with, uh, with uh, certainty, but I have read that some scholars actually say that out of all of the surahs of the Quran, this surah has the most quls in it. So you, you know how many verses begin with qul, say, O Muhammad? And it seemed, and this is a reminder that this shows you how much the Prophet was challenged in Mecca. That he's constantly being challenged and there's so much resistance that God steps in. And it's he's constantly reminding the audience, Oh Muhammad, say this, because they seem to forget that you're my messenger and I'm the one who's speaking. So that's, that's you know, not uh, that. The Surat Al-An'am contains the more, you know, uh, commanding verbs, قُل, you know, reminding the, the Meccans, reminding even the Muslims who were, maybe, who were maybe demoralized at this point, that what Muhammad is saying is from God. That's why Allah is saying, say, O Muhammad. So don't think for a moment that these are Muhammad's words. This, these are the words of God. And it also shows how much, how much, Misery and how much trouble they gave him, constantly challenging him, ridiculing him. You know, this this surah represented a very difficult time in the life of the Prophet. The end of the Meccan years, very few followers, persecution. You know, the Prophet doesn't know where he's going to take his, his new community. So it, it really is, subhanAllah, it's a very beautiful surah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really inspire us with the teaching of the, of the teachings of this surah. So anyway, if there are any questions, we'll take them. Yeah, I have one. That is, is this about when it says your Lord is swift in penalty or punishment? Uh, yeah. This is despite the fact that uh, when somebody sins, God gives the person like seven hours of time, this and that. So I'm just uh, not confused yes. looking at the word now, swift. Now when it comes to you know swift in punishment, now, of course, one way that you can look at it is that this is this is assuming 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you've crossed that grace period, right? So even, you know, swift in punishment, you know, if, if you commit a sin and Allah punishes you tomorrow or in a week, that's still, you know, in the larger scheme of things, that's a pretty swift punishment. But you can also look at it as when you commit sin, the damage is immediate. You know what I mean? When you when you take a blade, for example, and you cut yourself, the punishment for that, you know, I'll give you a better example. When you put your hand on the stove, when the stove is on, would you would you say that the pain is pretty quick? It, it the, the punishment comes to you pretty quickly. Yes. When you sin, brothers and sisters, Allah has the you know the soul, and in fact, any creature. When it disobeys God, the the pain that the soul feels is virtually instantaneous. It happens immediately. I mean, the, that's just, that's the nature of the soul. The soul is very sensitive. But so that that's that's one way of looking at it. And therefore, when you know when you seek repentance, you're basically you know that's why toba is is more difficult. Than refraining from sin, because you know, as as doctors always say, prevention is easier than treatment, right? It's easier to not smoke than to smoke and get lung cancer and undergo chemotherapy, right? So this idea of Allah is swift in punishment, you know, and and again, I'm not giving a fatwa here. But this this could be a reference to the fact that you know that's just the nature of the human soul that that the the damage happens instantaneously and there, but toba the door of toba is open but toba is basically the spiritual treatment plan for the disease that you've already contracted is it clear yeah and I had just one comment. Uh... On the part when it talks about religions being divided into sects, you know, I read something really uh, quite beautiful. I don't remember the exact word, but what it was was that um, had it not been for the uh, the thirst for um, power in men, religions would not have been divided into uh, sects or denominations. And I think that if you look at it, everything starts with a thirst for power. I mean, absolutely. That's why, you know, that's why Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, he says, dunya kulli That the love of dunya, the love of power, the love of domination, you know, all the things that relate to dunya, it's the it's the root of all sin. I mean, if, if you look at it, Islamic history is basically, especially what happened to after the Prophet, that, I mean, that's a story of hubbud dunya, right? You have people that came after the Prophet who just wanted the kursi. You know, what happened to Imam Hussein alayhi salam? That's, that's a story of hubbu dunya, the imprisonment of Imam al kazim This is just, this is people having just an obsession with this worldly life. You know, this, this insatiable thirst for the material world that pushes them to do heinous crimes. You know, they'll throw in They'll throw the grandson of the Holy Prophet in prison just so, you know, he doesn't rock the boat. Just so he doesn't endanger their empire. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that. That, you know, the love of power in, uh, in men and in people in general, I would say. Because, you know, we can't also forget that, you know, there are many times where, you know, you have certain women who are whispering things into the ears of these men. So I would say that one could argue who's more guilty, that's debatable, but. I think that by men wasn't like gender specific, it's just like, you know, old English, but they just use men for everything. Oh, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing, you're doing the Shakespearean English on me, okay. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I mean, I mean, the love of power, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, now verse one fifty, when I was talking about like uh, do, uh, bring your witnesses and stuff, uh, why does it say uh, do not bear witness with them? Because who would 
bear witness or which of the Muslims would bear witness with those people about so so, so the the verse the verse is addressing the prophet so the prophet is the primary addressee now you know the prophet was given the title of what a sadiq al amin right so the arabs you know if there's anyone in arabia that you want to bear witness that you're being truthful it's rasulullah even even the the jahili arabs would admit that that's why whenever they had any conflict who would they go to they go to the prophet he would resolve their disputes so the fact that someone of his noble character is standing and saying that these rituals are false i mean that does a lot of damage to their credence even if you don't believe the prophet even if they don't you know if, even if they're not muslims the fact that someone like muhammad ibn abdullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, is calling these people liars that that definitely you know shatters your credibility you you get what i mean well i mean yeah but this is this seems to at least the way i i interpret this it sounds like it's telling him hey don't bear witness to this and you would normally tell a person don't bear witness to something if they might otherwise be inclined to do it otherwise why would you even need to say this especially if this is a message being directed to the prophet <laughs> You know, it's it's not that the prophet was was inclined. You know, there there are a lot of there are a lot of things that the holy Pro, that the prophet is told to do. When Allah tells the prophet to establish prayer, is the prophet inclined to not pray? No, he's not. But sometimes Allah Subhanahu wa Taala just wants to highlight this, the importance of an, of a matter. So when when the prophet when Allah when Allah instructs the prophet. To not follow the desires of people is Rasulullah inclined to follow the desires of people? No, the Prophet is fully devoted to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But Allah is trying to highlight the danger of surrendering to your desires. Here, Allah is saying to the Prophet, "Don't bear witness to them." Not because he's inclined to, but Allah is trying to highlight the baseless nature of their claims that these people are attributing false things to God. So Allah is highlighting that this is so false that I want to remind you that someone as honest as the Prophet, who you gave the title of a Sadiq al Amin to, don't give them any, don't bear witness to the, don't uh, don't be a witness to their uh, rituals, you know, discredit them. Hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe, maybe there's just something kind of that's lost in translation here behind the way the phrase is used. Think about it again. If it's if it's not convincing, perhaps you know <laughs> I'm not doing a good job at uh, at explaining, which is possible. You know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, I'm Shaykh, thank you very much. Finished with Surah Nam. I, I think I deserve a medal for that for 15 verses in an hour. That, that's a record for me, right? <laughs> Yeah. Inshallah, we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Inshallah. All right, see you then, Inshallah. Send my salams to everybody. Fiyamana.